And well, tonight, um, it might have said Acts 13 that we're going to be in, but we're going to be, we're going to end in Acts 13. And we're actually going to do a little bit of a study on missions through the Bible and imagining where it really starts and walking through the Bible in it. And then it's going to be unique tonight in the fact that we're going to talk about what we as a church have felt the Lord guiding us to do in missions from the beginning of what we're doing today. And then how each of us here can be a part of that work that God is doing and wants to do. So, so let's get started. I wonder sometimes, I look at the crazy world around us. I, you pull up CNN, you pull up Fox News, and you see these insane articles about how the world is going to war, how it's just spiraling down, how there's hate, how there's uprising, there's no respect for, look at law enforcement, no respect for it anymore. And, and our world is just spinning out of control. And, and I can't help but wonder sometimes, even though I know the truth, my, my flesh goes to, God, why did you even put us here on this earth? We're just screwing it up sometimes. Maybe you've had that question as well. And, and it leads me to a number of passages, but one is Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of flipping tonight, so please feel free to do it with me or to listen um, if it's distraction to try and keep up. It's up to you. He says, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. He's saying it, if we were left unto ourselves, it would be a disaster. And we see that, right? The world, as they leave it to themselves and not to the Lord, it ends in complete, utter disaster. So there has to be, there must be some sort of anchor point, some sort of like homing device, a North Star, if you will, a, a guiding, a directing and we know it because we have it in front of us, and that's in the word of God. And what is the Bible? We talk about it a lot here, and how it's in it is the story of God's redemptive work for mankind, the scarlet thread through the Bible. The Bible is God's, a description of God for us in writing, and it's written to us, mankind, and in it is that redemptive work. And so there has to be something else. We need that anchor point and we're gonna look at it tonight because God wants to tell it to us. So when we, get, when we get fixated on a problem, such as what in the world are we on this planet to do? Or how crazy is this world around us? Or Lord, what is our purpose as Christians now? How do we walk this out? It's not just a subscribe to Christianity that we do, we're supposed to surrender our life to it, but what does that look like? What is your ultimate purpose? There's so many small things, but what's your ultimate purpose? I was taught from a young age something called taking the 30,000 foot view. Perhaps you have a rendition of that phrase yourself. It's to zoom out of the problem because if we fixate on the problem in front of us, it's better to zoom out and take the grand scheme, see the big picture of things. I get to travel a lot and um, I get to travel personally. Um, my wife Lauren and I, we love to spend our vacations doing all sorts of world traveling when we're able to. Um, and then in my job here at church, not only am I the worship leader, I get to partner with Steve Simpson in missions, and that includes running mission trips and, and doing missionary care visits. And, um, and it's a tremendous privilege. Um, it's a work that I couldn't be more thrilled to be called by God to do. And in the process, I get to traverse the globe and see things. And one of the things that I like to do is to look up the city I'm going to before I get there. I like to learn about it, its history, its culture, um, the language spoken, learn a couple key phrases maybe. And then I love Google Earth, that 30,000 foot view. Because what you can do is you can take a look at a city or a region of the world and you can zoom out as if you were sitting on the moon looking at the earth and you can zoom all the way in to see a license plate on a car. It, you have all that control to see that close and, and from that distance. And so in 2014, um, I got to go for my first time to Nepal with, um, with Steve. Um, Puma, the organization that he runs, um, the Lord through that organization is planting churches across a region of Nepal called Lamjung. And um, I think there's 25 plus churches now. It's an incredible work that God is doing there. And so I got to go on one of the trips where they're dedicating the churches, where Steve comes out with a couple people and a few of us actually in this room got to go together. And so before I went, I took the 30,000 foot view. I got on Google Earth 
And Steve showed me, okay, there's a church here and there's a town here. And you can see that there's like a town amongst all these, this greenery in the foothills of the Himalayas. You can see these towns. And I got perspective of this town's a little north from here. This one is over a couple ridges to the east, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we had five churches to visit. Then on the flight in, we're, we came in into the morning in Kathmandu and and we're flying and Steve pointed out how you could watch the, um, the Himalaya Ridge off in the distance. You, we couldn't see Everest, but we could see its ridge and all those mighty mountains leading up to it. It was, it was really, it drove me to all of our God. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So we land in Kathmandu, um, the dirtiest city I've ever been in and um, a really cool place, but dirty and, and clustered and busy. And, and then the next morning we got out in, in the field. And so we took, we took a Jeep, this is monsoon season, so it was muddy, the Jeep couldn't get everywhere, so we had to walk a lot. Even if it weren't monsoon season, we would have had to do a lot of hiking, because some of these villages are places where not even a dirt bike could get to. It's all by foot that you have to go. And so we would spend half a day sometimes, from early in the morning, walking to a church to do an an hour at the church to dedicate it, to pray with the people, to meet with the people and worship the Lord with them. And then a half day walking back out for that dedication. It was an incredible thing. But when we were on those hillsides, you see all the rice paddies around you and you can get lost in it. All you see is rice paddies. All you see is hills and greenery and it can be beautiful. But if it weren't for that 30,000 foot view, I wouldn't have had any idea where I was. I would have just been following blindly. And I still needed direction, of course, we all did from, from the Nepalese pastors with us, but that 30,000 foot view gave perspective. And so tonight, that's what we're gonna do. So let's start in Genesis one, as early really as we can go here. So in verse 26, <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image. Here's a picture of the Trinity. Don't let anyone ever tell you that God doesn't claim to be triune. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. We are in his image, in his likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let's stop there. So God's commission to man, right, is to be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion, to take charge over this earth that he has created for his good pleasure. And if we keep reading, we, we read how Adam and Eve walked with the Lord. And though they were naked, they didn't even know they were naked because there was no shame. There was no guilt. There was no fear. It was pure worship with the Lord and total communion with him day in, day out. And so the Lord, he commissions them to be fruitful and multiply. What's that mean? Does it just mean procreate? Well, that sure was part of it because now we have the billions of us here on planet earth. But he wants to fill the whole earth with his glory. We are in his likeness. In one sense, we are our, to reflect him in us, not only in how we are physically formed, but in, in the way we think and the emotions that we feel and express in our souls and actually our triunity, body, soul, spirit. I remember Pastor Jeff, he, he spoke on that a couple months ago when he was here. And we are made in his likeness. So we are to reflect him, to show him his glory and it to resonate around the globe. That's the idea here. This is where missions starts. No one was lost yet, but it was still to fill the whole earth with worshipers of the Lord. Some people think that missions begins in Matthew 28, 19, and we'll get there tonight, talking about go, make disciples, teach, baptize, etc., and that he's with us in it. That's not where it starts. It starts from the beginning because he's a missionary God. This has been his plan from the beginning. But then what happens? Sin comes in the fall, chapter three, right? Soon after, the serpent deceives, man in his free will decides to disobey and, and the fall is there. They can no longer be in the garden. 
And because when God has a perfect plan, there is the enemy. And his plan is to reverse, to debunk, to destroy God's perfect plan. But God's perfect plan is perfect and it can't be destroyed. God and his sovereignty knew all along this was going to happen and he had a plan for us. It wasn't derailed in the slightest by the fall. The missionary God was still at work. So then what happens? We've studied it here. We talk a lot sometimes about the Nephilim, about the corrupting of the image of God. And that's what happened. And, and God looked around the earth and, and who was left, but it was no one, his family that was left uncorrupted, who were seen as righteous in that regard. And so he saves them in the ark, a beautiful picture of Christ and our salvation. And the whole world is literally washed clean of this corruption. And they're commissioned with the same commission now, right? Be fruitful, multiply. This family now is to multiply on planet earth. But it, it's, it's a fallen people. The earth was still fallen. And so what happens then? The Tower of Babel is the next thing we come up to. I'm just gonna kind of take chunks of landmarks as we move through here. <clears throat> and, and they wanted to build this tower and be God-like. Some would even suggest that it was in memory of the flood they wanted to make this indestructible tower that could withstand even the worst disaster ever again. And it was that, that pride, that, that horrible sinful nature that God, rather than destroying with a flood, allowed confusion to step in. What did he do? He brought in all these different languages. And then what naturally happens when people have different languages, they cluster together with those that can speak in the same tongue and they separate it to different parts of the earth and ethnicities formed. Nations formed, kingdoms formed around language, around this culture that started to develop. Sovereign God didn't only mean to disrupt the Tower of Babel. He designed it also to make all these different people groups, all these different tongues, and then what does he do? Let's flip now to Genesis 12. We know this passage well. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> now the Lord has said to Abram, Abram, he's going to be called Abraham soon. The Lord says, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And here it is, underline this part. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So of all these different people groups, of all these different families of people around the globe, the Lord selects this one. We know it to become the nation of Israel. And it's through Abram, through his line, that God wants to save the whole earth. Because what was it? And in you, in you, in your family, in your people that will come from you, all the families, all the people groups that have been scattered around the earth shall be blessed. And by blessed, blessing is not referring to a good feeling talking about salvation. We're talking about Israel being a light to the Gentiles, and we see that commission to the Israelites as well. And so this is God's plan. And whenever God says, I'm going to bless you, I'm gonna make your name great, you just say okay. It's not something you wanna say no to, and so that's exactly what Abram does. He is the first missionary in that regard, because what happens? He is called out from his country. A missionary is one that is called out of their culture for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the Lord leading them to reach the lost. And so the Lord calls the first missionary, and that's Abram, soon to be called Abraham. He calls him out. And so Israel then develops, right? We see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob, their time in Egypt, the nation grew, and they escaped Egypt. Now they're in the desert. They're, the law comes, and, and the law wasn't just a set of rules. Israel wasn't just the nation that serves the mono, under monotheism, the one true God, and follows the law. That isn't what made Israel distinct. What made Israel distinct was that they were and are 
called to be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles is another word for the nations, those who have been scattered about that aren't in that family, that culture, that people group of Israel. And, and so the law was to set them apart and there was atonement in the law, but it was to make them that light that set them apart so that people would be attracted to them, right? People in darkness are attracted to light and that was God's plan. And he did it. We see throughout scripture, Gentiles being grafted in to the family of Israel. And if you read in Matthew, you read the genealogy of Jesus, there are Gentiles, there are some bad people in there too that are now in Jesus's line, his lineage through the, through the, through the line of David. And it's because the Lord grafts in because he is a missionary God who saves. And so there's this grafting in the salvation that was happening. Their purpose was to be a light. So we're going to now jump pretty quickly to some scriptures. Um, let's first go to Psalm 2, verse 8. This is a really cool picture of the father speaking to the son. It's, it's an amazing psalm. Verse 8, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. There's this promise of reaching everyone. It's not just to save Israel, it's to save everyone. This has been God's plan from the beginning. We're gonna keep moving quickly here. Isaiah 49, verse six. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So it's not only that Israel will be saved. I will also give you as a light, there it is, a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's the missionary God, to the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles, to all the nations scattered abroad. This is his purpose for Israel. This is the work that he started from the beginning. It's to redeem mankind. And then what happens? Jesus comes. John 3, 16, we don't even need to flip there, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, his one and only son, that whosoever, that's us, the whosoevers, should believe in him, will not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is the purpose now of Jesus. For God so loved the world, not just Israel. Israel was the light, the tool, and he made a promise to them that didn't end, by the way, with Jesus. It continues on today, his promises to Israel. And, but God so loved the world. The missionary God is at work and he sent his son. And I've always, since I was a child, been, been in awe of the gospel, in awe of the sacrifice that Jesus paid. But in the last almost eight months, it's meant more to me in a different way now because because I'm able to be a father. I have an almost eight month old Nora, the sweetest little girl I've ever laid eyes on. And um, she already has me wrapped around her finger. She's a six, eight guy wrapped around an eight month old's finger. It's an incredible feat that she's accomplished. And, and I love her so much, more than I could ever imagine. So many parents here, you guys get it. And it's probably, you probably love them more before they turn 13, but, um, but I'm in that stage, so let me enjoy it. And uh, I love her so dearly. And then God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for us, that he would love us that much, that he would desire that the whole world worship him and bring him glory to be saved so they'd never be separated from him, but instead worship him in eternity, that he would give his one and only son to be killed brutally to be separated from him, to atone for our sins, take the punishment that all of us deserve collectively on one man. That whosoever, and that's us, the ones that he loves so dearly, that we'll believe we can have everlasting life. So here it is. The missionary God, that heart is beyond, I, I love you guys, but I'm not giving my daughter for you. But God did. He gave his one and only son. And so then Jesus comes and we know Jesus' ministry here on the earth, how he walked the earth and all that happened. And then towards the end of his ministry, 
there's one of my favorite passages to study, and that's John 17 and Jesus' prayer. He prays for himself to the Father. He prays for his disciples, and he prays for all believers to come after. And so, but it's also, I heard it referred to recently as it wasn't just this beautiful prayer from son to father. Jesus was a missionary, right? He came to the earth. Talk about leaving cultural boundaries. He left heaven and came to earth to save us, to do more than any missionary could ever accomplish because he's God, he's Jesus. And, and he's done this ministry on earth and the end is coming. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's ready to atone and he's giving a missionary report to his boss, to his father. So if you read the entire chapter with that lens on, it reads a lot differently. It's been blowing my mind this week. So verse 18 Jesus is saying to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. He's referring to his disciples, those who have been following him. And then I'm going to jump to 20. I do not pray for these alone, those disciples. I don't pray only for my disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that's us, right? The disciples were commissioned, and we're going to look at that, to go out to preach the gospel. And then people got saved by the thousands. And then one by one by one. And onward and onward and onward. 2,000 years later, here we sit saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. Because we heard the gospel. Because of the gift from God that we've freely accepted and surrendered to. And so here we are today. His, his missionary report is that it would go out to the entire world not just the Jews that he was amongst primarily, right? We see examples of, of Gentiles in his ministry, but he was primarily in Israel, right? So a Jewish country. But the salvation wasn't for the Jews alone. Salvation was for the whole world. Missionary God is still at work. And now he sends us. So he dies. He atones for our sins. He goes to the cross. He raises three days later. And then he's on earth for a short while afterward. And it's that famous passage we all know very well, Matthew 28 and verse, verses 19 and 20. He's commissioning his disciples. He's commissioning us. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. There it is. It's, he's a global-hearted missionary God. Make disciples of all the nations baptizing them, Saturday's coming up, you haven't been baptized, it's time, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The missionary God didn't just commission us and send us out without anything. He's with us. He promised it there and we're gonna see how the Holy Spirit comes and how he fuels the church for his purposes. And, and a lot of times, even though it makes for, for great missions preaching, people say go. So we're all charged to go out to Timbuktu. That's really not what the, the original text, the original language said. It's, it's more of the sentiment of as you are going. In what position has he placed you in life? In what kind of occupation? In what family? In what region? as you are going, as you are living your life day to day to day, preach the gospel, make disciples. What's a disciple? Disciple is one who follows in a discipline, right? We have a discipline. Our discipline is to follow our savior. And we are to make disciples of him by being that example, by being a light to the nations. So as we are going, this is for all of us. This isn't just for those who are called missionaries and who are sent abroad and give their life in that regard. This is for every single one of us to disciple, to teach, to baptize, and to do it in his power. And so have you, I have been, I love worship. Um, I love leading worship. It's one of my greatest privileges in this life so far just to be able to lead worship. And... And sometimes, maybe you've experienced it here or elsewhere, when the saints are singing together, when we are all worshiping the Lord and the Spirit's moving, you get that sense. It's almost like a tingle, and, and whether it's an emotional thing or the Spirit moving, sometimes it's even hard to distinguish, but you just get the sense of, 
wow, that was a sweet worship experience. And when we look at the word worship, a lot of times we leave it there at this experience. And then there are some cultures, some, some churches and movements even that now seek after that experience, that feeling. They chase a feeling and, and they're left to chasing an experience, a feeling. The experience is a sweet thing that we're privileged to experience, but that's not the end game. Worship is designed for us to share worship to be a light to the nations. It's been said that um, missions, if, if the church was doing it right, essentially, that missions organizations and missions ministries within churches wouldn't have to exist because it would just happen naturally. Well, here we are, we have a missions ministry and, and we want to get behind it. We want to do this calling that the Lord's placed on us, but that's worship. Worship is doing exactly what we've been commissioned to do, going as we are going making disciples, sharing worship, not only experiencing for ourselves selfishly then, because we just come to church and we sit in a chair and we hear the Bible being taught, we hear worship played and we worship and we enjoy the experience and we go home and we leave it there. What have we been but nothing but, in a sense, spiritual gluttons? We take it all in, but we don't expel it out. We don't share it. So worship is not just an experience. It's to be shared. And so Jesus commissions the church there and right before he ascends to heaven, his, his last words. And, and you know, if someone's gonna share some last words, someone like Jesus especially, I wanna listen to the last thing that they say before they leave earth. And here it is. Right before he ascends to, to heaven, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to the church but you shall receive power. Right? He's commissioned them, they know that, but they know they need power to do it. So he's telling them, he already told them, I'm gonna be with you always, but now he's gonna tell them a little bit more about how that's gonna work. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me or of me in a sense in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, I'm sure many of us have heard this as well. And, and a lot of outreach philosophy, if you will, has been built around the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth illustration. Kind of like concentric circles, because we know geographically he was in Jerusalem, which is in the region of Judea. And then Samaria was outside of that, but not far. And and then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, well, that's self-explanatory, to the corners of the globe. And, and people look at it as just concentric circles and also as a this then. So minister in Jerusalem, then once Jerusalem's good, go to Samaria, then once Samaria's good and they're all saved and worshiping me, then go to Judea and then Samaria, and then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. But if we read it, and if you look at the original text as well, and you can use blue letter Bible and tools like that to, to say or to look at what the words actually were written as, it's not a then, it's not a sequential. It's a cumulative. They're all to be happening together as the Lord leads simultaneously. It's an and. So in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth simultaneously. And so the church gets their commissioning. They know what their mission is, what the task is set before them. And they know that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them. They already have the spirit because they're saved and he indwells them, but he's gonna come upon and he's going to do a mighty work empowering them to accomplish this mission. This applies to us. And so we fast forward now as the church is developing and uh, we're gonna make a quick stop in Acts chapter nine, verse 31. We kind of get a status report of how the church is doing. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria. All right, so there it is. Started in Jerusalem, we already knew that. But now all Judea, that whole region around Jerusalem and Galilee, all the way up to the Sea of Galilee, that Northern region, my favorite spot in Israel, and Samaria, so we have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and they threw in Galilee too. All the churches in these areas had peace 
and were edified. So the church was growing. The church seems healthy. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. They were multiplied. They were growing. They were healthy. It was a good, good thing that was happening. But now I can only imagine, and we're going to take a look at it now as we land in Acts 13, if you want to flip there. The church leaders, we see examples of how they minister, how they fast and how they pray and how they're in constant fellowship, breaking bread and how many are saved daily, adding to their number. The church is growing healthily, but they're fasting and they're praying. They're seeking the Holy Spirit because they experience the power of the Holy Spirit and they know they can't do this mission that's been set out for them without the Holy Spirit. And so they're fasting and praying. And I can only imagine that they're saying, okay, Lord, we've done Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. In whatever order it happened, we don't know. It could have happened simultaneously and probably did. And, but okay, how do we reach the uttermost parts of the earth? Because you know, travel wasn't as easy back then either. It wasn't like today where you can just buy a ticket and make your own way and make things happen. Something had to happen. Someone needed to be called out to do this and someone needed to be specifically empowered by the Spirit to do this unique thing of going out and crossing these cultural, these geographic boundaries to spread, to grow the church, to spread the gospel, to be used by the Lord in that. And so we find them doing just that, fasting and praying um, in chapter 13. I'm gonna actually rewind one verse and read verse 25 of chapter 12 because it leads in very nicely. And Barnabas and Saul, Saul becomes Paul, by the way, um, if you know the story, returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, that's up in Syria, so they, their basing, base of operations is Antioch. They had just been doing some ministry in Jerusalem, down south, now they're going back up into Syria. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, bad dude, and Saul, they're all saved. They're all leaders in the church and they're fasting and praying. Verse two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they, the church, sent them, Paul or Saul, Barnabas, away. And we actually read that they also sent with them a helper, who is John Mark, that we, we learn more about later on. Now, these are the first missionaries sent out by the church. The very first ones. And so, when, when we design something when we as a church des desire to follow the Lord in something, we go right to his word because we want to make sure that whatever we feel called to do is resonating with what we see in the word. And this is the first and a very clear example of a missionary being sent out by the church. So what happened? They were fasting and praying. It wasn't just, oh, this person's good cross-culturally. They're pretty smart. They have a gift of teaching. They should go out. It wasn't a logical decision necessarily. If you look back and look at their giftings, it, we can see how there was logic in it. But no, they were led by the Holy Spirit very clearly to set them apart for the work of the ministry of missions. And they were fasting and praying. You know, fasting, there, there wasn't as much going on in Roman culture, in society back then as there is today, right? We have all this technology, um, just an insane amount of things that we've been inundated with. But even back then when it was, we called a minimalistic society compared to what we have today, they fasted. Fasting usually meant from meals. And what was the purpose of it? It was to focus on the Lord and seek him by excluding any other stimuli and just focusing on what the Lord would have. That was their purpose in it. And so for us today, maybe there's something for us as a church to fast from. Maybe some of this madness in the world, the, the news, turn it off sometimes. Seek the Lord. Maybe social media. Maybe it's, who knows, the busyness of work even. Take that vacation as a fast. And, and so they fasted. They sought the Lord and prayed together. And, and in that process, the Holy Spirit said, now separate 
to me. So he says, now, the three parts here, now, separate, and to me. So now, immediately, not in a couple months, now, do this now. Don't wait, don't, don't deliberate on things, do it now. And then separate. So it's not them and the rest of the church going on a mission trip together, it's a specific duo that are to be sent out. And separate to me also in the sense of they had other responsibilities. Fill those responsibilities so they can go out to this work that I called them to. Separate to me, to God, the Holy Spirit speaking here. So to God, separate to him. Give them up to the Lord. Not to the church's ideals and logic of maybe how the gospel should go out. Like, oh, you know what? You should go to this region first. Because if you go to that port city, there's strategy that would get the gospel out to other regions quicker it wasn't that kind of process. It was separate to me, to the Lord. Let them be led by the Lord, just as the Lord has been leading the church all along at this point. So now, separate and to me, to the Lord, Barnabas and Saul for this work. So we see that today. Here's where we start coming in and talking about us as a church now. How do we act how do we as a church, what are we doing formally in the area of missions? I'm going to give you a little report on that. And then how does each and every one of us get involved in the great commission, the as we are going part, making disciples, and how do we send well these missionaries that are called to be separated unto the Lord for this mission's work? It's been said, heard from a number of people, and it's a, it's a phrase that um, stirred me when I first heard it and it kind of caused me to question it. But then as I thought about it, as I read the word, it's really true. It's, it's go, be that missionary. If you are called to be it, you better go. And if you're not going, you're in disobedience. So go, send, that's the majority of us, right? It's few that are, that are sent out, that are going. But the majority of us that are the senders, that are that church that responds to the Holy Spirit's call and, and separates unto him those that are called to go. That's, so that's us as the majority. Or the third option is to be in disobedience. That's really what it comes down to. It's very, very simple. It's to go if you're called by the Lord to do so for every other one of us to help send. We're gonna talk about how we do that tonight. Or be in disobedience. It's not a good place to be, by the way. Um, You've heard the illustration before. I steal a lot of material from Jeff Jackson. He's a great brother. And um, Steve and I stay in close. He's kind of our mentor in missions. And, um, and you've probably heard, I know my dad's used it since the illustration of the US Ronald Reagan. It's a massive aircraft carrier. It makes port in San Diego. That's why Jeff knows it well. That's why it came in illustration. So what's an aircraft carrier do? Anyone? Carries aircraft, simple, right? It's all in the name. Carries aircraft. Well, on this massive aircraft carrier are 90 fixed wing aircraft. There are 113 pilots, you know, so some of them can, can shift around and give each other a rest here and there. There's 113 pilots. The total crew, including those pilots, is 5,700 crew in total. So that means, in order to get 90 planes, that means 90 pilots, and not all 113 go at the same time. There's 90 planes. If all those planes were dispatched simultaneously, there are 5,610 people still aboard the USS Ronald Reagan, and their entire purpose is to send those aircraft to accomplish whatever mission is, is allotted for them. So, I like, I like numbers and I like simple ratios. That's 62 and one third people to send one person. So check out that ratio. So it's few that are sent, but every other person is required to be a sender. The person swabbing the deck, the person in charge of keeping the rust and the barnacles from growing off the side of the ship, the, the cook, the medics, the captain and, and, and the leadership of the vessel itself. Go on and on and on. All of them are charged with a specific task in order to make that aircraft function well, all for the purpose of sending those aircraft out and those pilots out safely. If someone doesn't do their job, if someone just doesn't feel like getting up that morning and accomplishing their job, their mission that's set before them, 
one of those pilots or all those pilots could die. So if something goes wrong, if someone doesn't do their job, their, their peers could die. It's a very serious task that they have. Every single person matters. No matter how small the task may seem, every single person matters in the mission. Everyone has a role. If they don't do their job, something's going to get screwed up. Someone could die. And so that's how we understand the church. Each of us have a role. The ratio of the USS Ronald Reagan isn't stamped by God. It's just a nice picture of the 62 and a third to one. But the concept resonates with the word, which is many send and few go. And so how are we sending? Are we sending well? And if we're called to go, are we being obedient to that call to go? And so there's a lot that happens within missions, under the name of missions. And it's good. The majority of it is good. And the Lord leads it. And, and different churches have different emphases. For instance, some churches desire to have a missionary on every continent of planet Earth. And that's part of their strategy within missions. That's great. It's not ours. That's not our strategy. Some churches want to uh, adopt as many missionaries as they can, supporting them all lightly, because you can't support well when you have 200, many, many missionaries, unless you have the budget for it, and that's hard to come by. Uh, what we, as a church, our church leaders have felt led by the Lord in this from the very beginning, since we started in 1999, and over the years, it's held consistent, this leading of the Lord. Here's our statement for missions. Prompted by his love, his love, Jesus' love. We preach Christ, releasing people from the power of the evil one and planting reproducing churches from Chalfont to the nations. So our work, there's many things that happen within missions. Our specific um, good burden that the Lord has laid on us as a church is for plant, the planting of reproducing churches for sending out missionaries that are doing evangelistic, church-rooted work. Not to say that anything else that happens in missions is any less. We just have a very narrow, we, as we understand it from God, focus and calling as a church. And so that's what we do in missions. That's what Steve and I are tasked with under the authority of our pastors to help facilitate. And, and we've had missions going on in this church since... I think our fifth anniversary was right before we sent out our first missionary. So that's, what, 12 plus years ago, 13 maybe years ago now, that we started planning and sending out our first missionary. We've had this desire from the beginning, and the Lord's been using us in it. And so, Russ, could you put that map of um, our missionaries up on screen? So we have... There's, there's the map of the world. And there you can see we have Central America, South America, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. We have different missions works that we are a part of. There are our core missionaries, our core missionaries, Rob and Beth Pudi, you know them. Pete and Jen Emery, and their, their boys Noah and Aiden. We have Steve and Arena Flores, and their children Anastasia and Josiah. We have fields of abundance, missions. They're planting churches in Nicaragua, led by Doug and Betty McRoberts, who have helped now plant the Lansdale Fellowship. And, and Puma, Pennsylvania United Medical Association, Steve Simpson runs that, and they plant churches throughout Nepal. These are our core missionaries. And core missionaries, it's just a term that we kind of came up with. It really defines those missionaries that we most of which have sent out, some of which we haven't. We've kind of come alongside them in the process. And, and that we, we support strongly financially. We are in um, close communication relationally. Um, many things are happening. There are core missionaries. It's a small cluster because it's narrow focus that God's given us and we're not a large fellowship and we can only do so much and we want to do more. And this is the few, that's our core missionaries. And then there's collaborative mission, uh, ministries. 
These are, these are groups, look, um, look at Almond Branch Initiative, doing great work in Israel. Look at Sharing the Journey International, preaching Christ crucified down there in Guatemala while they're fixing cleft palates and attending to people's physical needs. Incredible works that are actually birthed from people that attend our fellowship here and we want to get behind and collaborate with and, and, and support in that regard. So here's the map of them. You can see Guatemala, Nicaragua, Ecuador, that's Pete and Jen. United Kingdom, that's London with Rob and Beth. Um, Northern Israel, and then Israel itself. Israel itself is Almond Branch because um, they go around the nation. And Northern Israel in the Golan Heights in a town called Katrin is where Steve and Arena Flores have planted a church and minister there. And then in Nepal, where these churches are multiplying Quite literally, month by month, more churches are being built physically and house churches are represented by each of those churches. So you can multiply that number by even five sometimes, all these churches that are growing from this work. The Lord's doing an incredible thing and we have the privilege of being able to send and support it. And <clears throat> I've grown up in the church. I've attended, you can take it down, Russ, thank you very much. Um, I've heard lots of missionaries come speak, missions people come speak, urban outreach people, um, uh, every vein of outreach I've heard speak. Um, I went to Christian school from kindergarten through 12th grade. I attended Bible school and, and heard a lot of these things. And sometimes I would walk away with the sense of, okay, so if I'm not doing urban ministry, if I'm not going to Timbuktu, I must not be as good of a Christian. Man, I feel guilty for, for not going and doing that specific thing. And that's not the feeling, the sense that the Lord has for us. What happens is people come and they're impassioned and bold about what they're doing. And sometimes it can come across the listener as a guilt trip. It's not though. That's not God's heart. It's not a guilt trip. Few are called to go in different regards and it's all of our responsibility to be a light as we are going in our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhood, in our circle of influence, whatever that looks like, is to be a light, to be bold for the sake of Jesus, not to be a camouflage Christian, but to be bold. And then in that process, to send well those who are called specifically to go out as missionaries. And so how can, how can I, how can we be a part of this? Well, missionaries have needs. And sometimes we, we have this mindset of, oh, I attend church, and I worship the Lord by, by giving to him and the work that he's doing in this fellowship in the offering. I write the check, and, and then it's the church leader's responsibility to divvy that up according to the, the calling of the Lord on the church, which also then, of course, pertains to missions. So in that regard, I'm supporting missionaries. Yes, absolutely. Each of us, and we, we have great attention to how we support our missionaries in that regard. But it goes beyond that. It goes to individual connection with a missionary. The idea of the church and the church leadership sending a check to a missionary and having a program and communication with them is good, but it's the call of the entire church to send well. So that means individually, can we support them? Get to know our missionaries. Like them or follow them on Facebook. A lot of them are on Facebook and it's a good way of just seeing day to day what's going on. They try and post and keep people informed because it's important for us to be informed. Get on their email and their prayer lists. All of them have email and prayer lists. Rob and Beth, they have one that goes out every single Monday. So you can get on their prayer list and get a blurb of what's happened this last week. What are prayer requests? What are praises? What's going on? Pray. That's the first and best thing that we can do for our missionaries is to get on our knees and pray to the Lord for the work of the harvest that they are called to. And so it's communication. It's prayer. It's encouraging them. You know, um, Today, I believe, actually, is Aiden's birthday, the younger son of Pete and Jen Emery down in Ecuador, sending a birthday card. It's, it's an incredible thing. You know how it is sometimes? Like, I get a lot of mail, and it's usually bills, and I don't really like mail because of that. But, but when you get a birthday card, you just you enjoy opening those things. And so to send that, contact us. We can give you the information. Some missionaries, we can't send directly to them, but you can do it through the church, and we can get it to them sending those cards, writing them an email or a Facebook message or a post of some sort to encourage them to when you pray for them, to tell them you're praying for them. Don't do that Christianese game of saying, I'm praying for you and then don't actually pray. Actually pray and then tell them you're doing it. That's a huge encouragement. 
and communicate them. Ask them how they're doing and give them an update of what's going on back at the church. They want to know. That's one thing that Rob and Beth have told me a number of times is just understanding what's going on in their home church back in the States is of huge encouragement to them because they feel then plugged in better when they know what's going on. When we have Skype calls regularly and, and, and I'll ask them what's going on, how can we pray, how can we help you in different ways, we're always talking, but they almost every single time are saying, what's going on at Central Bucks? What are the different ministries doing? And how can we pray for you guys? Because they're part of our body. They're separated unto the Lord for this work that the Lord's called them to in London, but they're part of our body. So this applies to all our missionaries. Communication, encouragement. Some other pra practical thing, housing. A lot of our missionaries do have housing when they come to the States for furlough or for a visit of some sort, but some don't. So being available, and you can do that by just saying, hey, if you ever need a house, let me know, because we have this running list, Steve and I, of people with different resources for missionaries, and we'll just put you on the list, and when something comes up, we'll give you a ring. Housing, vacation giving, that's a huge one. When they come home on furlough, everyone wants to meet with the missionary. Everyone wants to take them out to dinner, and, and it is a blessing. It's a blessing for those of us who get to take them out to dinner, to have them over to our house, um, to spend time with them. But they've been pouring themselves out 24-7, in some cases without the network of Christian community that we have. And it's so important for them, especially those married couples, but everyone, to take a vacation, to have downtime, to take that long weekend or their first week of furlough and not talk to anyone and, and just go. And so maybe there's, maybe there's a beach house, maybe there's a mountain house, maybe there's an idea of, oh, I could send them on this little vacation. Sometimes even, I, I know of examples where people have said, oh, I know they're in that part of the world, what if I bought them a and b, &B um, somewhere in the region nearby that they can get to so they can go on a vacation while they're there in the field. That is such a huge practical way to help missionaries. Giving free services, accountants, lawyers, doctors, Give them free help. Our missionaries, a lot of times, they still have to do their U.S. taxes. April 15th comes for everyone. And, and lawyers, you might be needed sometime. You never know. And doctors, dentists, can, can we give them a tune-up in their home for free? And can we help them out in that way? Can we um, take a look at things for them? Be a church in that regard. Loaning a vehicle. Some of us have that second or third vehicle that's not being used all the time. And just again, letting us know so we can put it on the list of available resources if there's ever need for a vehicle when they're home for a week. Caring for them in whatever regard the Lord would lead you in. And communicate with us on the missions team because we want to help you in that. We like to be aware of it so we can, we can facilitate well. And you know what another great way is? Going on a mission trip. We... We sometimes look at mission trips and say it's really cute that the senior high and the junior high go on these mission trips and it's crazy what the Lord does through them and people get saved. But we categorize it as to the 18 and below crowd should go on mission trips and, and we're, we're a little more mature than mission trip material. That's not the case. A mission trip is for the purpose of encouraging that missionary. At least the way we do them here, it's to encourage the missionary. It's really not for those going. We get the blessing, the joy of serving in that regard, but it's really to help that missionary. And, and so we've done them to London. We're going to do one again in, in early June of 2017, another one to London. We're going to be visiting Pete and Jen Emery um, in the fall of 2017. And there's more things. We're trying to build more mission trips so, so us as a church can go out and encourage our missionaries that way. And I told Rob and Beth, because they're our, kind of our pilot missionaries that we've been starting these adult mission trips with. And, and I said after the first one, and I said after the second one, said, are you encouraged? And don't just tell me, you know, be straight with me. Are you encouraged or are you more weary because we came? Um, was it good? Was it bad? We do a very thorough debrief. Because if it's ever not profitable or encouraging for the work that they've been called to, we're not doing it again, or at least not that way. I mean, we'll have to do it differently if they want it. Because the purpose is to encourage the missionary to preach the gospel. That's, that's why we go. That's the mission of the mission trip. And so go, encourage, care for, give to our missionaries. This is how we can send well. It's not just writing a check, even though that is so important because that is such a practical need for the work to continue because our world revolves around finance. But so many other areas, we sometimes can just feel helpless. Like, what else can I do? I like this thing of missions, but what else can I do? Well, here, well, here are some ways. 
or just to come and ask, hey, what can I do to help in missions? We want to help you in that because it is healthy for each believer to encourage their missionaries that way. And then be a light where you are. Missionaries are so encouraged when we as a church are healthy and doing what God's called us to do. So being a light, evangelizing, doing outreach. When there's these need prayer events, get out and be a part of them. At Hope in the Park, evangelize. Be out there amongst the people and preach the word. Rob and Beth tell me all the time that the fact that we have developed, uh, some in this church, a heart for the lost who are lost to Islam, the Muslims in our area, and now there's actually a work that's brewing as we speak of a core in our church that are gonna start doing outreach to the Islamic community in our area. And you can be a part of that too if you want. And they are so encouraged in their ministry to see the same passion the Lord's put on their hearts resonating here back home. It's an incredible encouragement to our missionaries. And it's what God's called us to do. So these are the ways that we can send well. And maybe you're called to go. Most people in this room aren't. But if you are called to go, respond to the call. Don't sit any longer. No matter how old, no matter how young, no matter how experienced, God, it's a classic cliche, I guess that's redundant, of God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. If he calls you, he will get you ready for the task that's ahead. So be a light where you are. And finally, I'm gonna make another plug for it, that missions conference. I'm gonna to read to you the back of our brochure. We just had them done this week. And you'll be seeing them distributed around the church in the next week or two. On the back of it, Steve wrote the reason we're doing this conference. I'll read it to you. Doing his work through men and women serving him in the field, Almighty God is doing great things around the globe. His kingdom is growing, his church is growing, and his son is coming. Join us to hear and learn from men and women who have been busy in God's work and seen his saving power and his saving work firsthand. This week of missions will stir and challenge you to be more closely connected to Jesus and challenge you to step even deeper into his work. You will taste and see in a new way how wonderful and exciting God's plan for the nations is. That's why we're doing this conference. It's not only for those people who feel called to go, it's for them, absolutely, but it's for every single one of us so we can better understand our missionary God to gain more of his heart and then to send well in response to his call for us. So mark your calendars, sign up. Registration for that Saturday, that cheap $20 registration is gonna open up after um, Hope in the Park Men's Weekend later next month. It's all coming. The Lord's doing great things. He has much more in store and he's privileged. We are privileged to be called by him to take part in it. So let's stand together and let's pray. Lord God, you are good and it is such a privilege to be called your sons and daughters, to be used by you, the missionary God, as a light to the nations so that you would redeem mankind. Thank you for coming to earth and saving us. And so, Lord, tonight, as we stand here, we want to surrender our lives afresh to you again, saying, Lord, how would you use me? How would you use us for this work? We don't want to just be Christians by a label, Lord. We want to really be surrendered disciples of you, Jesus. So show us how to do that. Give us wisdom, Lord, and fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through your word. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks.